So we have a few patient souls here. This panel is anything that stands between you and drinks afterwards. Uh, we'll keep it interesting so you don't even notice how time flies. That's what we're trying to do. So we try to tell stories and I'll start with a simple story about myself. Back when I started in the year 2000, I was working at UBS in UBS's IT infrastructure team and we built and engineered the fastest, most secure and quite decentralized databases at that time. And one of the companies helping us do this, of course, even at that time, long time ago, was at Novum. And at Novum had Stefan Ahn as a founder, joined UBS, and then my office was on the same floor as Stefan Ahn's at that time. Today, we also have somebody from our Novum here. Sonia, please introduce yourself. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sonia Duke. I'm a cybersecurity consultant at Anovum, IT and cybersecurity um, company. At the core, I'm a cryptographer, but nowadays I'm working in cybersecurity uh, in assisting the clients uh, in setting up um, secure architecture, secure processes, making sure that they're protecting well their assets. Thank you. After UBS, I joined PwC and built up their blockchain competence center from 2016 to 2020. And early on, talking to the auditors at PwC, I realized that there's something new that they need to learn. There's no longer just code running on mainframes and on distributed computing systems and in clouds. There's also code running on blockchains, smart contracts that you need to be able to audit. So we bought a team of brilliant smart contract auditors, seven people that we onboarded into PwC to extend the capability there. That was chain security. And today we have Luciano here from another smart contract company, please. Hello everyone, glad to be here. My name is Luciano Ciataglia. I actually work every day auditing smart contracts, not only smart contracts, but also layer one, D app, and everything that is within the Web3 space. I am currently working as director of services at Hacken. Before that, I work as a uh, technical lead in security in Binance. Uh, and even before that, I was a developer. So I moved from several industries. First, I was a developer. Uh, then I betrayed development. I moved to cybersecurity. And then I betrayed cybersecurity in Web2. I moved to Web3. So that's uh, the change. Wonderful. And I betrayed the big four and auditors and moved to Bitcoin Swiss. Uh, to take over the chief product office and also the head custody role. And of course, as part of these two roles, I spoke to a lot of custody providers. We wanted to have an understanding of where the market is and eventually also wanted to have a proper multi-custody solution. And one of the people I spoke to was, no surprise here, Sebastian with CryptNow, CryptNox. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Sebastian Reder. I'm um, the CEO and founder of the company CryptNox. So it's a company that specializes in uh, smart cards uh, for blockchain. So basically, these are uh, hardware wallets. We currently have two products on the market. Uh, but more specifically, we also have a, a business product that allows for the issuance of uh, smart cards. So basically, hardware wallets was also. Uh, for f fintech or, or banks, and uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to actually work on this project together with Adnovum. It's a very valuable help to, to, to this topic. Thank you. So for the last year, I founded a boutique consulting company called ACK Consulting Knowledge, and I'm helping banks, crypto foundations and startups to find their way from strategy to product to operations in crypto, all of that securely, of course. And one of the foundations that I support right now is Definity. And again, I'm sitting door to door with Jan, please. Hello, everybody. It's sort of uh, nice to be like on a banking symposium here because that's really the way I started to get into crypto or it was called cryptography at the time, where I, during my, my PhD work, I worked on, on eCash, like uh, together with like a project with uh, UBS at the time, at the UB Labs, that's how I got into crypto back then. And then later on, I, I moved to, to IBM on all kinds of crypto, uh, cryptography, cryptography protocols, distributed systems. And like almost, well, almost to the date, like I, I 
got contacted by, by, by Divinity and uh, really liked the vision to build like a, a world computer, like a distributed system that can scale, th that can be like a crypto cloud. And uh, yeah, I guess then, then I was hooked to that and then the joint uh, Divinity to build uh, the internet computer as really like a crypto cloud if you want to replace Amazon and all of that. And so here we are again, talking about banking, e-cash, and all of that, happy to do that. Right, and of course, we're all here to learn about cybersecurity and how it applies to banks, specifically when it is about crypto. And when we say crypto, we mean cryptocurrency, of course. And in order to understand this, I actually want to take a step back first, because this is actually the second coming of crypto with banks where banks struggle to understand what's going on, where banks are challenged to assess the security of systems. So we're first going to look back to the first coming of crypto, which is when the internet came up and cryptography at that time enabled banks to do a totally new kinds of business on the internet. And afterwards, we're going to look forward just to open up the minds about what all the possibilities are when you speak about cryptocurrency, blockchain, decentralized trustless networks and banking. And then we will spend the majority of our time, of course, on crypto cybersecurity as it's relevant for banks today, because that's what we're all here for at the end of the day. So looking back, Jan, how did banks learn how to do crypto? Well, I don't really know, but I have like this uh, one uh Story I still remember when I talked to a cryptographer's colleague of mine who was doing consultancy for banking. And he told me the story while he was uh, evaluating the security of some uh, online banking system. He looked at it and then he talked to some developers and then uh, he talked to the, asked developers, okay, so where, where are the keys? And the developer sort of opened up the drawer and here, here on my floppy disk, right? I think th that's how banks initially treated uh, like online banking or like th their online presence, not realizing that the, those SSL keys were probably even more secure than their bank vault keys, right? And I think th now today have come, come a long ways, right? There's a HSMs or all of that. So I think banks today really know how to manage their keys and so on and so forth. And maybe talking about, about, about today and, and banks in, in Web3, I think, now users are left with the problem to manage their keys and I think they have <laughs> devices in their drawers or sometimes even worse like directly on, 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 their, on their live systems. Right? I think that that's also like where banks can really play a huge role in, in Web3 and help users with, with that expertise. And yeah, people say like not your, your keys, not your, your money. But you know, like my bank account also, <laughs> maybe I have like a, my, my you know my Swiss francs with, with some banks, and it just works fine. Why why not my crypto? Yeah, history may not repeat itself exactly, but it does rhyme from time to time. And Sebastian, uh, you mentioned how did the, the things evolve in the card business? Yes, for regarding like evolution of uh, technology to finance uh, cards are actually a very, very interesting example. So uh, the first uh, credit, credit debit cards uh, appeared in the 50s and they were like, basically uh, a little piece of plastic uh, until fast forward today. Uh, and they are dem dematerialized, you can use them with your phone. Uh, and just you can tap it in two seconds and you're even annoyed if you have to tap it twice, and it might take more than 10 seconds. Uh, but of course, this did not happen overnight. Uh, you first had the magnetic stripe. You had various technologies that have been uh, uh, integrated uh, through time uh, into, uh, into this payment system. Uh, you had the magnetic stripe, then you have a, a chip uh, technology with all the cryptography that had to be Im implemented around it. But you also had uh, the communication. So, so first point of sale, uh, maybe people remember here, if, uh, you, you would use a landline communication to access the, the merchant bank. Uh, and then with the evolution of secure communication on internet, this became very, very, very efficient. Um, and uh, we're, we're now we even have, like uh, as everyone, everyone know, we even have on, uh, online gateway, online payment gateway. Um, so this is really great. I think today we can, almost, almost uh, talk about uh, the digital currency 
uh, digital money at least because basically if you make an uh, online payment like this, you're just flipping bits. So you can argue somewhat, somehow that is digital. But uh, one thing that did not change in uh, that technology is the logic of the underlying payment network. So it's exactly the same as in the 30s. So you send a, a, a request to pass a bookkeeping operation. Uh, and this has been optimized, uh, it has uh, all the latest uh, uh, technology in it. So it, it looks very, very efficient. But the underlying logic of the payment network is, is almost 80 years old. And I think the next step into this, uh, this type of payment system will be the implementation of blockchain network technology to replace the old network that we're use, still using today. Let's take that and dive into the history of SWIFT. How did SWIFT actually come to be, Sonia? Uh, well, SWIFT um, has actually a predecessor that gives us a, a nice example on how cybersecurity evolved. So there was a telex before, uh, which was used not only by banks, but by in any other uh, sectors. Um, so this change from telex to SWIFT um, shows us uh, several lessons that we learned uh, in cybersecurity a long time. So first, as uh, Jan and Sebastian uh, showed, there is a continuous evolution in cybersecurity. We have a continuous fight between uh, the methods that we are putting there out there to, um, to protect uh, and the uh, methods that the attackers are using. So there is always this evolving and this uh, getting better at getting and protection uh, of the, all the assets that we have. Um, another, uh, I would say that just to comment with what Jan said about uh, the story uh, with how they sto uh, stored their um, keys, another lesson that we learned is that we need to have standards, standards that are trusted and that are vetted by the community. Um, they offer the baseline security requirements, they offer the good practices, and they also enhance operability, uh, inter interoperability between uh, systems. And if we go to the minimum uh, security requirements, go back to the history of banking, um, the telex, the switch from telex to SWIFT, although it was not made necessarily because of security concerns, uh, shows that there was this evolution and that there were principles that started being respected, like confidentiality, integrity, and availability. While in telex, uh, messages were not protected, uh, they, their integrity were not, was not protected, and although it was a reliable system, uh, it, there was no protection against uh, a disruption of, uh, of, the, of the system. In SWIFT, with time, things evolve, and now um, we have this confidentiality, integrity, and availability that is ensured. So with the payment rails, with the settlement rails, so all becoming digital and protected, of course, we're also making progress with digital money, didn't we, Luciano? Uh, yes, actually, I would like to go a little even older at the real beginning, actually, of how the whole revolution of the digital money started. It was, uh, it was a, a huge revolution, and this is only the second one, because we can say that the first one was when we moved from uh, physical money to digital money at the beginning. That was on the late 20th century. What was the cybersecurity measures before the digital money? Well, like armored trucks, I imagine, guns, <laughs> uh, guards, of course. That was the protection mechanisms that we had back then. Uh, then in the late 20th centuries, we started using digital money. And well, we need to change the strategy because uh, the money right now was different. And the main, actually, that st started all that new kind of protection mechanism was cryptography. Uh, we don't have more guns, now we have cryptography. And we don't have rovers, we have hackers. Uh, that was a huge revolution, actually, that is still going on. And this is, we can say, like the third phase. Uh, and it, it has actually something that Jan said that it was really true is like, the differentiation that we have nowadays, if, if, you, if it is not your keys, it's not your money. That was even the same back then. I mean, I, can, I could have the money on my pocket, and it was mine. Or I could delegate the responsibility of handling my money to the bank, well, carry my money to the bank, and the bank take the responsibility of it. I think in the Web3 ecosystem, that can work in the exactly the same way. If you don't have actually to have the responsibility of handle your keys, you can give it to a bank or a centralized exchange. So actually, that was like the whole evolution, and right now, the in, with cryptography, we still have a security mechanism right now, 
but in different implementation that is in, in Web3. We have all the cryptography implemented in Web3, and it's the foundational layer, actually, of Web3. So we have asymmetric cryptography, symmetric cryptography, hashes. All of them are, are implemented already in Web3. So it was like a natural flow of the glowing of the money. And that's why it's so easy, actually, nowadays to start interacting between banks and uh, Web3, because the nature of how we want to handle our money still remains the same. So that's it. So that's a lot of serious talking going on here. I'd like to loosen it up slightly and, and do a little bit of crazy talk about the future before we come back to serious talks about cybersecurity of banks. Uh, as we prepared for the panel, Luciano, you said you wanted to speak about not making paper money digital, but making KYC processes digital. Yeah, again, actually, when going back then, how was the QIC? Well, I have, like, my passport. I could present it. They got validated that it was me. Okay, take my money. Okay, it's, this money is from Luciano Cetaglia. Here I have the ID, so I know it's him. Uh, then we moved to digital <laughs> currency, and we started having the digital QIC. Of course, that back then, we also could have, like, security measures in QIC. For example, like... Uh, a printer, a biometrical uh, signature, anything actually that can validate that that's this ID that I am showing was, was, was real, it wasn't fake. Uh, right now we have in QIC different ways to validate also in digitally a person, that is for example a video, a photo, or different things, but we also have mechanism to bypass those security mechanism that is for example the AI. In AI, for example, you can you, you have a picture, like only a, a picture of me, like this one, and you can make it move. <laughs> so actually, if you show that picture that they have that back there to a QIC nowadays system, and it's starting to move, and uh, the QIC asks you to smile, for example, or to move your face or anything, actually the AI can do exactly the same with my picture. So that's actually a new challenge that we have in cybersecurity nowadays. Uh, but there are mechanisms that they try to don't rely on this video or photograph things that they can have these gaps in security. Some of them, the most crazy one and nowadays that are growing are, for example, soulbound tokens in Ethereum that you have like one F NFT and that's NFT, it's only, uh, it's soulbound, let's say, to your wallet. So it's only in your wallet and you cannot move it to anyone else. It's your ID. And you can sign with that and that's actually really interesting because imagine that uh, when I go to the airport, I don't need to present my passport anymore. I can show them, okay, here it's my NFT, you can read it in a QR, and that proves already my identity and that I am that person, and I don't need to show the passport. And all my personal information is going to be there, exactly that as right now. So if I lose my passport here, and anyone take it, they are going to see all my personal information because it's there. At least if, if I lose my phone, uh, the information is encrypted, so it's going to be harder. So that's actually some really interesting. There are all other initiatives like decentralized identifiers, the IDs. Uh, that's actually another good initiative. There are, there are even consensus mechanisms that nowadays, like proof of humanity, where people do QIC of each other, like doing videos, asking questions. They do Q QIC of each other, and they receive rewards based on that. Plenty of projects, actually. So it's growing really fast, and uh, it's I am not sure how it's going to end, but I like actually the shape that is taking. Crazy things that are probably not too far away. But Sebastian, when you speak with clients, with banks about how they see the future, do they mention these or what do they actually ask? Um, so we've we've basically we've seen a, a shift into the interest when, when we took um, about our, our, some of our solutions that are for for B two B solutions. Uh, when we started to pitch about like one year ago about you know what can we do with blockchain, here I'm talking about like big big retail banks, and they were like, okay, but you know like web free NFT, DeFi, okay, this is really really cool, but like do we really have like an, uh, an immediate incentive to uh, start uh, implementing s some uh, offerings related related to, to that? And they were like, um, no, there was not. But this has changed. Uh, this has changed recently, where, uh, whereas now uh, they're mo mostly looking at, at two things. First is the stablecoin, definitely. And this related to blockchain payment network technology, it can, it can immediately bring two advantages. One of them is um, a decrease in IT requirements. 
And the second is um, the um, decrease uh, of commission. There, there are many ways to basically bypass some intermediaries. And they see tremendous uh, interest into uh, reduction of cost. And this is an immediate incentive to, to start looking at this, uh, this uh, at implementation uh, related, yeah, more, mostly what they're talking about is, is a stable coin. And uh, that's a big shift. I'm, I'm pretty confident that uh, there will be acceleration uh, on, on that side in the near future. That actually doesn't sound too crazy, but very reasonable for most banks. But let's take this back to crazy again, Jan. When we have decentralized communities, can we have decentralized banks? Well, I think the, there is a sp space for that. I think that there's, uh, as you see, the uh, crypto e evolving, right? I mean, Bitcoin started as a decentralized uh, system. Why wouldn't you have like uh, decentralized banks, decentralized money with, with Web3? Uh, you like own, you can, people can together make, maybe make a bank, make an insurance. And we, we see that already with like uh, what we have on, on the internet computer where projects can decentralize, they can have a DAO that runs a business, uh, the business could be a bank, but they, they also can do like f f raise funds like that, you have stocks like that. It's like, over the whole world, we were seeing like the, like an economy will, will like evolve also in, in like in cyberspace, right? And I think banks will, will have to support that as well. It's like so we, we're going to see like stock markets and that like move all to to blockchain because it's it's more effective, it's globally accessible, uh, and so there's like many crazy things. Well, maybe not so crazy, right? I think it's logical, it's natural if you talk about cybersecurity. You want to have like more dis distributed decentralized system because it's just more secure, right? Bitcoin never got hacked. Well, maybe people's wallets got hacked on their, their phones, but Bitcoin itself, despite the security proof, only came in coming ways later. Uh, but Bitcoin never got hacked. So it proves that a distributed system is way more secure than, than a centralized system. So there's like lots of stuff that are, is going to be built like that in, in, in the future. Right, so when we look into the future and slowly think to come back to cybersecurity standards as they apply to banks, maybe just briefly, Zonia, cybersecurity standards, what do we expect in the future before we take this back to today? Uh, well, so less rocket science, less innovative and less exciting. Um, we need to follow and we need to adhere to the standards. Um, so when it comes to the um, cryptographic standard, for example, um, the standards that are going to normally put in place uh, this year uh, should be post-quantum cryptography. Uh, why? Because post-quantum cryptography uh, tries to provide protection against the threat of quantum computers. Now, there's no need to panic. We're not there with practical compu quantum computers, but it's good to be prepared. And I think what's important here is that banks, especially given that they are uh, dealing with critical data that has a long lifetime, uh, should be uh, concerned by this and should uh, think about this transition from classical cryptography that we have nowadays to uh, post-quantum cryptography um, um, that we are going to go um, to. Um, from a community point of view, from the cryptographic community point of view, we are ready. The standards are almost out there, but I think there is a transition uh, going from standards to secure implementation to decisions taken, technical decisions on what um, uh, what solutions to be adopted, uh, to uh, seeing what is your critical data and what's to be protected, and to do all this transition in changing um, protocols, in changing um, security protection that you have in your own uh, banking systems. So I think this is also something that needs to be taken into account. Again, that's exciting than um, the innovation that is also going on right now. So what we hear is that quantum computers will be able to break cryptography as it is today. Would you like to know if that applies to you when you have a Bitcoin wallet or that, that this applies to your bank if your bank holds your Bitcoin? Hold up your hand. All right, Sonia. Well, um, I, I like to be an optimistic person, but when it comes to quantum computers and when it comes to classical cryptography, most of the protocols are impacted. So it's not it's not only the banks that are impacted; it's all the other uh, financial, all the sectors, all the industry sectors that are impacted, uh, that are using security protocols that we're using nowadays. Now, on the cryptocurrency part, I would say they are a bit less impacted because you can do the change and you have a bit more time to do the change overall. But still, you are concerned. 
have anything to add, Jan? Um, <laughs> no, I think essentially that's true, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not worried, and uh, but, but of course people have to move. Also, if you look at the blockchain space, Web3 space, there's a lot of stuff that would uh, break down if, if quantum computers are built. On the other hand, I, I remember like, like uh, I was at Aarhus University, like uh, I left there in like, 99. I was going to, uh, my last day somehow, uh, by coin, I know, knew that they have a quantum computer there, so I wanted to see it before I leave, right? And, and so I, I got to see it, had like four qubits that could uh, be stored, uh, you, you know, like for, for like uh, fractions of milliseconds. I, I, I don't remember, I should find out again. Uh, and, and then uh, like when, when I left IBM, I said, well, okay, I'll have to do the same now. It's my last day. I, I got to see the IBM quantum computer. It's like 52 qubits. It was also, and that was like 20 years in between or 19 years in between. So it, it, have, it had evolved, but of course you never know. Maybe sometimes it's like, uh, it doesn't work linear, uh, linearly how, how things evolve. But, but still we were very far away from having like a practical quantum computer. So I'm not worried. I'm not having sleepless nights, right? But maybe going back to the standards, that to me standards are, are very, I mean, very split mind on it. Of course, you need standards for interoperability, but also in particular for cryptography. I mean, we have like a bad history of standards, right? And you know, there's some really bad standards where, where like, uh, you know, so some countries had uh, wrestled in their their things. And I think in, in cryptography, we we do have like you know, like scientific advancements of, of algorithms. So I think you, you should not, never do a standard or something that has not proven itself, right? I mean, uh, so the look of like AES is a good, what was a good process, some other process or not. I think it's very important that you only standardize stuff that has proven itself, right? I mean, uh, otherwise you, you, make, you, you might make uh, big mistakes there. How long does it take for standards to prove themselves? Well, that that depends, right? I mean, you have to have something like, like up and running. You have to have peer-to-peer uh, -peer reviews, especially if it's security crit critical, right? But no, un unless you haven't found like wide consensus within like a scientific community, you cannot uh, think of something to be secure, right? And so, if, if you do that stuff in standardization, but it's not going to happen. It's the wrong people there, right? So you you want to have like. Uh, like uh, in, in for crypto cryptographers, like for other parts, like I guess you, you're not going to do a standard for like whatever atomic power plants for, from people who have no idea about it, right? You should always uh, vet your stuff with, with the experts in the field. Uh, and since we landed here in the middle of actually two days standards and discussions, I just keep asking you, Jan and, and maybe Sonia, about a question in standards that I constantly get when we speak about crypto custody, which is. <coughs> Pardon. Is MPC ready for custody as a new type of storing private keys? Or do we still need to go to the HSM that we're familiar with for like 30 years? Well, I mean, it's totally ready. I think like we, we know multi-party computation has been out there since many, many years. And, and threshold crypto also exists since many, many years. So. So I think for, from, from a standardization and protocol point of view, it's, it's totally ready. Now, it's a, still like a complex technology in terms of implementation, right? It's, of course, hard to implement something that's a distributed system that's just a, a single uh, system, right? But, I mean, there's a ton of like threshold crypto protocols out there. We have implemented it on the internet computers, other blockchains, there's other systems that have done it. So, in my view, there's no reason to use like a single HSM, but of course you could still use HSMs because if you look at HSMs, how most of them are done today, they're more or less a normal computer that are, is put into a box, right? That they stand secured. So if you open the box, the computer is erased or like the hard disk is erased. So what what I would do, I would take those computers and implement threshold crypto with them because that's the, the best you can can get. So use HSM technology together with, with multi-party crypto. I think that's how, how you would want to do it today. Can anyone comment on the state of implementation of MPC when they look at like uh, industry leaders who use MPC like Fireblocks, Taurus also has MPC implementation, others? Or is it really coming down to actual implementation? But actually there are a standard 
uh, has five blocks already approving this standard. The standard is quite new, so I cannot say that this standard, as we are talking about NIST or ISO 27001 or SOC 2, so it's not that old. Uh, but at least Fireblocks, for example, the MPC computers and actually any kind of company that use crypto or they have a portfolio in crypto, they can use this standard that is called CCSS, it's Cryptocurrency Security Standard. Actually, the name says, a, says, says already a lot, like it's like really generic name. So it covers actually uh, all this, and Fireblocks is one of the approval. They have three levels, level one, level two, level three. Each level has a set of requirements. The higher the level, the higher the requirements. Fireblocks is in level three, actually, that is the highest. Uh, and, and, and it's good, they, they still need more companies actually to fulfill in this standard. It's not going to replace what we have for SOC 2 or ISO, but it's actually like a complement, it's something else. I mean, you take the SOC 2, but uh, these security standards, they don't care. It's not that they don't care. In the requirements that they, don't ha they have, they doesn't take much about the cryptography or the crypto ass address, uh, assets you have. And this is standard that is going to cover that. So it's actually, if you have one, you should have both. So there you are covered in like everywhere, like 360 protection in the standards, let's say for security. That's one of the things actually. All right, so you're saying that it's not just a single implementation of a way to do signing such as MPC, but it's the overall thing. And maybe we can take a step back and look at how you actually assess the threat landscape, Sonia, and when it might be very concrete. When we have a bank, and, and most banks who are here today either already have done the work or will have to do the work to onboard crypto and make that available to their clients. And even those who are not here today are going to make it shortly. It's just inevitable. But then what processes do they follow? How can they do this correctly so that at the end of the day they know they have a secure system for the assets of their clients? Well, in cybersecurity, when we do this um, um, security assessment, we look at three dimensions. We look at people, process, technology. So people, um, in the case of a digital asset um, uh, bank, it would be uh, the end users, so the clients. Um, as traditionally, uh, we need to provide education, training, uh, so they make educated um, uh, choices um, as traditionally it was done for the password hygiene, for the phishing awareness. This needs to be adapted also uh, for the new uh, for the new digital assets. And then you have also the employees training. So you, you don't want to have a top-notch uh, digital asset solution, uh, but have the people that uh, don't know how to securely um, manage it. So this is the first dimension. The second dimension is the processes. So there you have all the compliance, regulatory um, compliance um, with all the regulations that you have in the banking, whether it's anti-money laundering, whether it's KYC. Uh, you need to ask yourself a questions whether this new um, service that you want to put in place, uh, which enhances the digital assets, are respecting uh, the standards. You need to actually use standards that are adapted for uh, digital assets, as Luciano said. Um, and you also, of course, you need to make sure that what you're putting in place complies also with the guidelines and the standards that you have inside your bank. And besides this, you need to have also processes for incident um, recovery. So what, how do you are going to detect, how are you going to monitor, how are you going to recover um, in case of a disruption, in case there is an attack. So you have to take all, all the processes into account when you set up something, a new digital service. Uh, and lastly, and I think this is where most people ask their questions, is on the technology part. So you need to uh, look at um, the, the service that you want to offer to your clients, and you need to look at every level of security, starting with physical security and going up to the, late, uh, to the smallest, uh, let's say, unit, where you have all the keys and secrets on how you secure them. So you need to, to, to do this in uh, these three dimensions, but also you need to take into account that the threat landscape is in an enhanced uh, threat landscape where you need to take into account all the critical issues, all the security problems that you can have with the blockchains, with the smart contracts, with NFTs. Uh, um, this is a something, this is a landscape that evolves very fast and the threats are evolving also very fast. And the timing is moving ahead very fast, so get ready to ask questions. I'll have a final question for Sebastian. To take that around, we heard about what banks are doing when you design a custody system for banks, what are you looking at? 
Yeah, so uh, basically for banks, so uh, if a bank decides to, to implement a custody solution, so it's a process that we have to go through more like a, a little bit like if we were ourselves the bank, so w we know a lot about it. Uh, so there, there are three, three ways to do it. So, so, but basically once you implement a custody, it means you have to manage keys. It means that you need to have a ceremony around the keys and I need to have a disaster recovery. So there are three ways to approach it. So first, you design your own solution, which is uh, becoming more and more easy. So basically, you can take an HSM uh, and start designing a JIRA that would be related. But there, as Sonia said, it's very important to, to know if you have the team around it and also if it economically makes sense. Uh, so solution number two, it's you take something off the shelf, so you have various uh, solutions which are uh, MPC based or HSM based, so there's a lot of debates. Some people are like, yeah, MPC is the best. Some other people say, no, you have to take HSM, it's older, it's more reliable. Uh, or you have uh, the third option is, is to use uh, sub custody. So in this case, it's not your key, but still your coins. Uh, but uh, in this case, yeah, it's uh, probably for like a smaller entities. It's much faster uh, and much easier to implement. And in this case, you need uh, a low, uh, you need the cyber security team to have, uh, not have as much experience into all the, the, the crypto cyber security that is required. So yeah, it's, the, each entity has to go through all the, the options and decide what's the best. All right, thank you. So when I look around, I, I'm not very sure, is everybody just eager to get going or are there actually one or two questions? <coughs> questions? There is a question in the back. We can hear you very I, I, I repeat the question. What is the impact of multi-sign technology in the impact uh, on cybersecurity for banks? So that, that's multi-signature like Bitcoin multi-sig, but probably also MPC like multi-party computation type signing. Uh, All right. Yeah, I think we covered that a little bit with MPC. Maybe, Jan, you want to get into that slightly deeper? Well, I, I think at the end of the day, multi-signatures are is just like one way to implement something what people usually call threshold crypto, right? And then whether you have like several parties signing individually or whether you have like these parties contributing shares to the signature scheme. I mean, it, 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 uh, it's at a very high level, it, it, it's, it's the same thing. Uh, so yes, of course, you, you, that's uh, the way to go if you want to have like MPC, as I said before, maybe combined with HSMs even, right? I think it was actually related also to multi-site wallets, like they're simple when you have like five keys and three of them can sign and if you have majority, the transaction is being done. So if it is that actually, it's a good security mechanism because you don't have only a, sing a single point of failure that is only one signature. You have at least, you need at least three of them. Uh, I am talking about five, we can talk about seven, 10, and you need a majority of those signatures in order to process the transaction. So that's actually an additional layer of security that it needs to be done. But you also need to also take care of the uh, backups of all these signatures. So whenever you have 10 signatures actually to approve a transaction, you need backups of the 10 of them, and you need to take care also of the 10 of them. Uh, you need policies for the 10 of them. You, you need like a ritual, as uh, Sebastian said, actually for all of them. Uh, but actually the risk deserves being taken instead of having a single point of failure that is only one signature. So yeah, multi-sign, MPC, all of them, uh, three-hole implementation, all of them are way better than the, the standard one. <laughs> only one signature, one transaction, that's it. Uh, so and there was also the question of what is the impact on the bank's cybersecurity procedures or the risk in general, maybe Sonia, this is something you've been thinking about. Well, so, so Luciano said um, there is this, or even Sebastian mentioned it, um, this key ceremony um, that uh, is 
and uh, this is something that actually Crypto Valley um, provided guidelines uh, for having a secure um, uh, key ceremonies. And there you have, um, there is this need of having several participants, um, several key custodians uh, that will actually take the role of uh, offering the backup for these keys, for this number of participants um, uh, there. So it's, um, it's a complex, um, it's a complex um, ceremony, it's a complex, um, um, that, that takes a lot of time, that requires a lot of coordination, a lot of people, uh, but then you know that you have something that's secure, something that is you, for which you have backup, and something uh, in most of the cases that can be auditable, uh, so provides assurance. Maybe, Marcus, if I may, right? Uh, I think, honestly, this is the wrong approach, right? Because, I mean, some of the problems that, that, that you mentioned, and I think, like, the, the project, Marcus, that I guess you and, and I, and others that Definity are working on it actually does that as a different approach, right? Where you uh, separate the management of the keys from actually how the keys are, are, are you know, like the, the management of the signing process, who can sign, and so on, from how the, how the keys themselves are, are managed, right? You, you want to separate that. An approach like, like multisig, you, you don't separate that, right? You, you want to have like threshold crypto so somewhere that takes care of that as a, as a uh, commodity solution. And then you want to have like the, the management of the signing, the authorization, you want to have that separate as, at the separate layer really, right? And so because like, like that's where MPC and, and the threshold crypto can help you because now you say, okay, so who authorizes, uh, authorizes the system to sign on, on your behalf, right? And then you can say, okay, well, now I can have like a different policy on top of that. I can manage my, my users differently differently if a user uh, loses access, you can grant them access. I think that's like how any other, like normal <laughs> systems are, are, are built, right? And I think like, like, and here the blockchain space still has to learn th that you, you want to keep these things separately, right? Yes, I see Nikki is impatient to get the drinks. Let's help her and us all <laughs> to get the drinks. A big applause to our final panel. Thank you so much.